Grab your Bibles. Let's get ready to go to the Word. We're going to walk through the Word this morning and uh, hear what God has in store for us. Go with me to the book of Acts, chapter 5. Um, uh, a challenging passage of Scripture. I just want to share this with you to share some truths from this passage. And then we are going to allow God to be God. So here's what I want to do before I even um, dive deep into the Word. I want to invite you to come out Wednesday night. On Wednesday, we're going to dig into this um, with some great discussions. So you might hear some things today that may not settle with you or may be challenging, but come out on Wednesday. We're going to flesh it out and allow God to be God. Acts chapter 5. If you're there, say amen. amen. Bibles are important around here. Let me read. Uh, it says here, but a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a large a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, And Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And then it says, After it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. Lord have mercy, he died up in church. Jesus. And great fear, well, duh, fell upon all who had heard it. And the young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in. Lord have mercy. Not knowing what had happened, and Peter said to her, tell me, whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. And immediately, Lord Jesus, she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. That's some jacked up stuff, boy, yeah. Yeah. And, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we open our hearts to you. We open our minds to you. Holy Spirit, speak. As we look at Scripture, we want to understand what's happening here in the text. But most of all, we want to get to the place where we love you, we commit to you, we obey you, and we do what you call us to do. Felix moves out of the way. Speak through me to your people. Give us understanding and let this scripture be relevant to us. So most of all, we pray for adjustment beginning with me and moving throughout this entire congregation. It is in your name we pray and thank you. And all God's people say together, amen, amen. amen. Um, let me start here um, and I'm just going to walk you through my um, sermon this morning. When it comes to God and his kingdom... Don't say what you will do, then don't do it. Is that all right, y'all? Don't mess with God. Yeah. When it, comes, when it comes to God and his kingdom, don't say what you will do, and then don't do it. Here is um, the problem with New Testament era and the Old Testament era. In the Old Testament, man, God used to just take people out like it was nobody's business. Oh, come on, y'all. When, 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 I mean, you, you were scared to lie in the Old Testament, right? Um, prof, prophetically, people would not utter prophetic utterances unless they were sure it was the word of the Lord. Because biblical text says, or the way the Bible worked in the Old Testament, if you said the Lord told me to, told, to tell you and God didn't tell you to tell them nothing, it was just you talking, man, God will take you out. He really, really would. He really, really would. As time has elapsed and as time has progressed, we now have fooled ourselves into thinking that in today's day and age, God doesn't operate the way he do, did in the Old Testament. Don't make that mistake. God is the same yesterday. God is the same tomorrow. And he is the same forever. He is a consistent God. That's very, very important that we not miss that and we not understand that truth. He is a consistent God. Even though we may not see some of the things that we saw um, or read about in yesteryear, in today's day and age, does not mean that God has softened up or that 
God anymore. He's still God. And so the challenge is, is that when it comes to the things of God, we need to understand if we say, God, I'm going to do, God expects that we hold true to our word and we honor what we say we're going to do. Does that make sense, guys? This text that's in front of us that we're going to look at presents us with an illustration or a story of a couple. And the couple ended up doing something that was displeasing to God, and God did not appreciate the way this thing went down. And as as we saw from the reading, he took corrective action. Now, for you to really get the gist of what is going on at the time of the text, I need to back you up just a little bit and give you some literary context so we can extract the principles that reside within the confines of the text. Understand with me that we're in the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, the church itself had just begun. Jesus had just left the earth realm, and the birth of the church was probably just days, if not months, if not just a short few years old. And of importance for you to understand is that there was a high level of integrity that existed within the church within that time. Might I be so bold as to say, at the time of the text, Satan had not yet entered the church. Are you with me? Might I be so bold to say that? Because if you were to back up with me to Acts chapter 2, and just back up, let me just point a couple of things, and then we're going to get to uh, chapter 4. If you get up, back up to Acts chapter 2, specifically around verses 42 through 47 within that window, I want you to notice to me what it says in verse 42. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. Verse 43, and all came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Look at verse 44. All the believers were together and had all things in common. Come on, say they had all things in common. Say it again. Say they had all things in common. Look at, look at verse 45. And they were selling their possessions and belonging and distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. Does that make sense? All right. So in other words, Robert Matthews was selling those Stacey Adams and giving the money to the church so I can buy our executive pastor, Stacey Adams, because he didn't have none. Oh, y'all, y'all not tracking with me. Are you with me? Yeah, is if a person saw that they had something that you didn't have because of the concept of equality in this new church, there wasn't no social status rich and poor. There wasn't an economical divide. Everyone was walking together. I want you all to get this picture with me in the new church. So they were selling what they had and bringing it. Uh, and look at, look at what it says in verse 46. It says, and day by day attending the temple together, breaking bread in the, their homes, they received with, um, their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And then the last phrase says, the church was growing. The church was growing, all right? Because there was equality in the church. Let me, let me use this word. There was unity in the church. We talked about unity at men yesterday. Come on, say there was unity. unity. Say it again. Say there was unity. unity. Okay? Then when you, you, you read this text, as you walk through it, chapter 3, you see some stuff happening. You get to chapter 4, you see some more stuff happening. But then the same principle now again is reiterated in chapter 4 around verse 32. So look with me at verse 32. This is a very, very important pretext as we go into the story. Then when you get to verse 32, notice what it says in 4 and 32. Now the full number of those who believe were of one heart and soul, meaning everybody or every person, every believer in the church were unified when it comes to the things of God. And lock into this next phrase. And no one said that any of their things, of the things that belonged to them, was their own. That's striking to me. If I own a house, I didn't say the house was mine. I had sense enough to realize that God gave it to me. Oh, I need a witness in here. They didn't have cars back then, but those that had chariots had sense enough to realize that the chariots, did, that as many as they owned, did not belong to them. 
It belonged to God. So nobody in that community walked around saying, my, 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 my. Isn't that different from church today? Come on, say amen. Okay? Now watch this. Notice what it continues to say. And it says here um, that they had everything in common. And verse 33 says, and with great power... The apostles were given their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord, and great grace was upon them all. There was no needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each one as any had need. Man, this is like some good stuff. And look at this now. It gives you an example. Look at the next verse. It says, Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means a na- um, son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at, his apostles, at the apostles' feet. Here's what the text is saying by way of pretext so we can get to what I want to share with you this morning. I want to share um, three simple things, and we're going to move through them fairly quick. That's why Wednesday is so important. Nobody was saying that what I had belonged to me. They understood that God was doing something new in the community. God was doing something fresh, and they were more concerned with making sure that within the church, Nobody was struggling. Come on, I wish I had somebody in here. Nobody was on welfare. Come on, y'all. Nobody had a quest card. Nobody, they still have those? Yeah, I wouldn't, yeah. yeah. Come on, y'all know, quick, yeah, no, amen, yeah. No, nobody had, nobody, come on, had, 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 well, let me use a term that I can relate to, food stamps. Nobody was in the cheese line. That was in my day. You can't, you can't get, nobody was struggling. Because if anyone had, my stuff belonged to God, and they would sell it, and they would bring it to make sure people had enough. And the text says now, there's this man by the name of Joseph, uh, who the disciples or the apostles called Barnabas. He had a piece of property, and he sold it, and listen to this, he brought the proceeds, and he laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, if you look at at chapter 5, how chapter 5 opens up, very, very open. Critical. Chapter 5 opens up by saying, But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Do you see a problem? Come on, do y'all see a problem? Given how things were working... Given how what was happening at the time of the text, where folk were selling things and bringing everything for the benefit of the community, we just had an illustration of Joseph called Barnabas selling a piece of land, and then the text opens up with this conjunction, chapter 5, but we had this fellow named Ananias with his wife Sapphira, who did the same thing that Joseph did. Theirs didn't go so well. All right? I want to share a couple of things with you, okay? Let me start here by pointing this out and lock into this. Selfish concern for a superior reputation is never tolerated in God's economy, okay? Here's what this says in English. In God's economy, he is not interested in people one-upping the other. Does that statement make sense? Okay, he's not interested in, 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 in God's church with big eyes and little U's. I wish I had somebody. Yeah, yeah, I want y'all to walk me. So, so, so he don't want you to do one better. He wants you to do one the same. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. He, he wants you to do one the same. Let me, let me see if I can paint a picture of what's happening here. Understand with me now. Understand with me. I need to paint this picture, this vivid illustration for you to put in an eye sense of fire within the confines of what I'm about to share with you. About this time, the church had grown tremendously. Last time we saw in chapter 2, about 3,000 people were added to the church in one day. Sometime between chapter 2 and chapter 4, another 2,000 were added where the church was up to about 
about 5,000 people plus and growing and growing and growing. And understand with me now, when they brought these offerings to the church, it was more than likely in a public setting in a large gathering, the thing, the thing talk about Solomon's um, port, the, the, the place where Solomon's portico, I'm, I'm, the word slip in my mind, but the, con- what was that? Thank you. Solomon's colonnade, Pastor D, been studying good. Solomon's colonnade, where the congregation is gathering together, and you've got to see this. You've got to see this. You've got to see this, okay? Folk are coming every Sunday, and the apostles are probably up front, and here's what they're doing. Hey, um, Pastor Peter, today I sold my mule, and I got some money for it, and I really didn't need my mule because I had like four of them, and this one was parked more than it was being used. So I sold it, and here's the money for it. And here's what Peter would say. Hey, church. Church, give Solomon, I mean, give, give this person some cheer for what they just did, right? Praise the Lord. Bless him. Then another person would come in front of thousands now, and they would donate, and they would give stuff. Then all of a sudden, Joseph called Barnabas comes, and they said, hey, Peter, we sold some land, and, and here's the proceed for it. I pray that this money can bless somebody. And here's Peter and them. Hey, let's celebrate Joseph and Bar- Barnabas for what they did, and thank God for what they did. And lock into this. Here's Ananias, and here's Sophia. Hmm. I know how we can get some recognition. Because when I look around, we got the most money up in here. Up in here, up in here. So I'll tell you what we'll do. He held a secret meeting with his wife. Okay? Who said we had to give them everything? <laughs> who said? Yeah, y'all not hear me. Yeah. Who, who said, who said that they need to know? how much we made when we sold. Hey, man, Joseph just made the Bible, and he got praise. Now, they didn't notice. I'm just going ahead here. We can make Scripture too. We can one-up him. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, because we have more property than he does. So why don't we do this? Why don't we sell it? And we know it's worth more than what he has. We can give more than he ever dreamed of giving. And we can still keep some. And, man, we can look good. Heck, they're going to build that facility after us. (laughs) Y'all missing this. They can build this facility after us for what we did. Okay, now, now let, let, me, let me just kind of move to this, and I really don't have time to deal with this because there's so much I need to share in such a short time. If you are giving for the wrong motives, let me be the first to say to you, when it comes to God, keep your gift because we can't impress him. Yeah. Come on, are, are, are you hearing me this morning? God wants the heart. He doesn't want the substance. Are you with me? And a lot of us think that we can position ourselves in the place of God to look good by one up in somebody else. Well, she's saying, wait till I get my song. I'm going to show them how to really sing. Come on. I'm going to tear it up. Because y'all, y'all not hear me. They're going to give me every song. But he preached, wait till it's my turn to preach. Well, she prayed, wait till it's my turn to pray. Well, he give. Let me tell you what I'm going to do. Because we want our names in the light. And God is not interested in that. It's the condition of the heart. It's the condition of the heart. It's the condition of the heart. It's the condition of the heart that God is after. Are you with me? And these people mistakenly believed, and we'll flesh this out in a little while. I'm going to move quick. Might have to pick this up next week. That they can position themselves and lock into this. Look good in the congregation by one up in. Now, here's the important thing I need you to hear me to say. Up until this point in time in the life of this new church, nobody had ever tried to one-up somebody. They were all unified. They were all of one heart. They were all of one mind. Okay? And, and, And this is not part of the message, but I need to say this real quick. If we ever fool ourselves into thinking that we can breed this unity in a place where God is trying to unify his body, I'm trying to tell you, watch out, because some Old Testament stuff can happen to you. Are you hearing me this morning? Don't ever make the mistake 
of, of putting your selfish concern to get you a reputation in the congregation and think that God's going to be pleased with it. The God that I serve don't function like that. Matter of fact, I think it was, what's it? Um, the scripture talks about he humbled himself, Philippians, made himself of no reputation. Here's what, remember one time Peter and them, Peter and John came to him, James and John came, hey Lord, when you set up your kingdom, give me a seat right next to you. Here's what he says, if you want to be great, you must be what? Servant of all. So God is not interested in people knowing your name. He just wants to know your name. When we set out to make names for ourselves, watch out because we're positioning ourselves. Are you hearing me? We're positioning ourselves. So be cautious of selfish motives. I have to check myself when it comes to the things of God. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about, come on, say it's about God, y'all. Say, say it with me. Say it again. Say it's about God. So don't you think about one up and nobody because some Old Testament stuff can happen to you. I'm going to keep saying that, all right? I want to So number one, number one, selfish concern for superior reputation is never tolerated in God's economy. So now let's, let's walk through this. Let's walk through this because I want you to lock it. So here's the second thing. God does not tolerate evil deception then, number two, among his people. Okay. Because for me to get to a selfish motivation to try to make me look good, there's got to be something wrong with me. Because understand, in the economy, they had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and bringing all the proceeds and laying it at the apostles' feet. Then all of a sudden, one somebody shows up and tries to mess it all up, and God prevents it from messing up his church because he would not tolerate that behavior in this new church. So let's read. Let's read. Let's walk this out and let's read what it says. So now notice with me at verse, go to chapter 5, verse 1. It says, this, But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And the text says, And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Okay? And then Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to you uh, to you lie to the Holy Spirit to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. And then he talks about what he says. Here. So let, me, let me show you something. Let's look at this. Let's look at Ananias for a little while. I want to point Ananias out. So let's look at Ananias. Five things. Two, that's five, yeah. So let me start with D. If I had to do this over again, I'd do it different. Let me start with D. When you look at Ananias, well, look at A. Let me do A. He did not have to engage in the behavior that he did. Okay? So let, let me start here. You don't have to do it. You don't. Let me, let, me, let me explain what I mean. Let's read, let's read verse 4, then I explain what I mean. Those are verse, while Peter saying to him, while you had the money in Ananias, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Okay? Why it is that you have contrived this deed in your heart, and then he talks about you have not lied to men, you've lied to God. So here's the thing. Your money is yours, your gifts is yours, your resources is yours, your talents is yours to do with it, excuse the term, what's the never you choose to do with it? It's yours. Are you with me? So here's what Peter's saying to Ananias and Sapphira. Hey, it was your stuff, okay? You were good where you are. You didn't have to do what you do. But by virtue of the fact you make a decision to do something and then you end it up not doing the right thing based on the decision that you made, you invited God to now deal with you. Does that make sense? Okay? He didn't have to do it. So look at number four. Here's the problem. He allowed, number one, Satan to fill his heart. Say he allowed Satan to fill his heart. Let's read, let's read, let's read, let's read. Notice what it said. Let's kind of talk through this. So here's the problem, and I want to point that problem out real quick. It says here, but Satan said, verse 3 to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? Okay? That's a very, 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 very important thing that I want to flesh out, and then we're going to walk through this real quick because I want you guys to hear this when it comes to the things of God. The heart is deceitful. Your heart will fool you into saying he's single when you know he's married. (laughs) 
Come on, y'all. He going to be my husband. No, no, baby. See the woman next to him? That's his wife. And you be going home dreaming about, bro, man, your heart showing you in the house with the little picket fence. <laughs> this is very important. The only reason that can happen is not that God says. Because here's what some of us will say, the Lord told me. God ain't told you nothing. It's not that the Spirit is speaking to you. Are you hearing me? It's not that the Spirit is doing anything. Hear, hear this. It's the enemy trying to enter the camp of God. And the only access he has into the camp of God is the people of God who make space for them in their heart. I wish I had somebody in here. Are, are you with me? Yeah. Because if you lock into the text, the text is very, very clear. They had unity. They had everything in common. The church had it flat going on. It was growing daily. The community was filled with awe. Come on, children's ministry was bombing. Come on, youth was going on. Adults were getting healed. Marriages were being restored. Everything was happening, and Satan had no access. No access. And here's what he did. He went around looking for somebody. Let me say it different. He went around looking for somebody who had unresolved issues. <laughs> yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. And then he found somebody who had unresolved issues, and he planted a thought. Here's how you can do this. And, and, and what's interesting about the way the enemy will come in, sometimes when he comes in, and we're going to hit Genesis if time permits, it doesn't always look bad because he ain't stupid enough to come say to you, just flat out, go kill somebody. He will show you how you can get a blessing. I wish I had somebody in here. And then the other part, I can make you look good while you get the blessing. How, Ananias, have you allowed Satan to fill your heart. And that word fill is written in the indicative mood, which what that really means is that it's the mood of reality, meaning that that thing really happened because here's what Peter's trying to say to Ananias. The reason I know he's in your heart because I can look at you and I see evil all over you because what I'm seeing is, 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 is you are now oppressed. You are now influenced by this evil person. Church, guard your heart. Come on, y'all, please. Guard your heart. Guard your heart, okay? And then, and then check this out. Always align your heart by what God is already doing. If your heart gives you ideas that looks different than what God's been doing, don't check what God's been doing. Check your heart. Check your heart. Because the text is clear. From the time the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2, the authors keep saying, this is what's going on. People are getting healed. People are getting blessed. People are getting, come on, are you with me? And there's no selfish gain. There's no selfish gain. There is none of that. Then all of a sudden, somebody soars up with an idea to talk about how they can promote themselves, and God has to deal with it. So he allowed Satan to do what? To fill his heart. Check your heart. Come on, point yourself. Say self. Check your heart. Very, very important because that joker is subtle. I'm telling you, he's subtle. Y'all not hear me when I'm telling you he's subtle. He ain't going to come overtly and talk about, no, no, no. He's going to sneak up and his stuff is going to look like the Bible. Hey, Amen. I know how you can tithe. <laughs> and I can have that tithe return a blessing instantly. So now, let me walk through the text. He kept, he, Satan filled his heart, and because he filled his heart, B, he convinced his wife to participate with him. Spouses, let me not just say ladies, because men, women do this to men too. He convinced his wife to participate with him in the deceit. Okay, now this is deep. This is deep because that word says where it talks about he, 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 um, he with, with his wife's knowledge. That word knowledge literally means that they had dialogue 
and they shared the same conviction. Okay, let, let me tell you what the word says. This is a very, very heavy word because it's written in the perfect tense. Here's what it says. It could look like this. At first, she didn't agree with him, but by the time he got done, she aligned. Okay, and here's the alignment. She was so committed to the deceit that she was willing to be his ride or die chick, no pun intended. <laughs> are, are you with me? Okay. She was so committed to the deceit. Okay. Let me keep moving. Let me keep moving. And then look into the text. The text says he kept back a part of the proceeds for himself. And here's the text. Why then did you keep back a part of the proceeds for himself? Now, this is a very, very important phrase, and I'm going to move through because I'm running out of time. That, that phrase, he kept back, is written, it's the middle voice, but it's reflective. Here's what he's saying. That the thing that he did, he found himself to be more important than the people who needed the blessing. I'm going to bless y'all, but let the record show I'm going to one-up you. I'm going to never let you get past. So whatever I do, it's going to look like this. Never this. That's reflexive, right? I'm doing it not because of you. I'm doing it because it makes me look good. I want my name on the plaque. I want my name on the cornerstone. So the reason I'm doing this is that he kept it back for himself, okay? And then jumping down to E, the most important theological point that I don't have time to deal with, that we're going to deal with this on Wednesday, is that when he spoke to Peter, here's what Peter says, you're not lying to me. That's critical. It's critical. So, church, this is for me. This is for me first, right? And then it's for all of us. When we come before the presence of God and are crazy enough to open our mouth to say to God what we're going to do, and then we don't do it, and we think we're talking to the person in front of us. Don't make that mistake. That's why in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, it talks about thou shall not lie, right? Why? Because you're not talking to the person in front of you as a child of God. You're releasing stuff into the atmospheric realm that goes to the ear of God, and God will not tolerate it. Okay? So here's Peter. Peter. Now, now you might want to, how did Peter know? Well, because Peter had the Spirit of God on the inside of him. I wish I had somebody in here. You're thinking? And so he wanted to be clear that, that, that when you lie, when you, when, you, when you had blatant enough to say that what you're doing and you didn't do what you said you're going to do, please understand it might fall on my ear, but the Spirit of God dwells within this new church, this community, and God is hearing and God is revealing the truth of your actions. Here's how another scripture says, it. What is done in darkness will be what? Because you're not deceiving man. You're doing it to God. You guys get what I'm saying, right? Very, very important. Very, very important. Don't miss this. Let me, because I, I really don't have time. We can come back. So like this, he does not tolerate evil or deception among his people. So that's what Ananias did. Look at what Sapphira did. Like, let's read. Let's read. Let's read. I'm almost there. Let's read. Let's read. Look at what it says in, what's that verse? Verse 7 to 9. Jump down to verse 7. I'm back to after an interval for about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, hey, what's up, sis? Your husband brought a big offering, man. Um, is that how much it should have been? And listen to the ride and die chick. Yeah, we talked about it. And look at this. Yeah, we're trying to do good for the church. Amen. Yeah. And Peter said to her, how is it, listen to this, that you have agreed to what? Together to do what? To test the who? The spirit of the what? The Lord. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I'm, I'm back into this. Look at a couple of things. She agreed together with Ananias. Remember the word with his wife, full knowledge. This word agreed together is written in the passive voice. And what that means 
that, that, that the text does not say that Satan filled her heart. What we saw was her husband convinced her. Y'all remember Genesis chapter 2? Adam was going about his business, and Eve reached up and did what? And she did what to her husband? Convince him. Yeah. Doesn't this look familiar? Doesn't this look familiar? Okay. Happy around going her business, okay? And, and then her husband now convinced her to participate with him. Spouses, spouses, this is critical for the next point. Be careful what your spouse convinces you to do that's against the way of God and expect your home to be blessed. Come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. Are you with me? That's why, you know, I, I hope she ain't watching, but I thank the Lord for Pascatani a lot because Felix ain't always right. Oh, don't act like you right, too. Come on, y'all. Yeah, don't, come on, y'all. Yeah. And then and sometimes she just comes, you don't want to do that. And I'm like, why? She said, but God, but, and then hear me out. But I know how we can work it out. And she says, you don't want to do that. And then it hits me. Ah, oh, Satan is trying to feel, yeah, yeah. You got to be cognizant, okay? Look at this last thing. And the text says she tested. She tested. She tested the Spirit of the Lord. Why, Peter, why did you let your husband convince you? And then why did you think you can test God? This is critical because here's what the test looked like. I know what God says. I know what my husband has a plan. Let's see if our plan, if God will not catch our plan. So, 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 Ananias, let's try it. Maybe God is asleep. Isn't that why we sin? Come on, y'all. I know we ain't supposed to do this, Sharif, but maybe God ain't looking. So just one quick hit, bro. Come on, y'all. Don't, don't act like that's not why we do it. Because we fool ourselves into thinking that we can deceive him this one time because he's not looking. God is too big to ever fall asleep. He is omniscient. He knows everything. Come on. He is omnipotent. He has all power. Come on. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. This is so dumb because while they're planning, God is sitting there. No, they're not. No, they, I know. Wait, wait, hold up, hold up. Hello? And we fool ourselves into thinking that we can get away with stuff because God might miss us this one moment. Does this make sense? So, so, so uh, let, me, let me move here, let me move here. Let me move here. So because God knows our hearts, guess what God's going to do? Expose and judge the sin of deceit. Scary text. When I read it, when Peter questions Ananias and says, why would you do this? My Bible says, I jerk it drop dead on the spot. Right? Now here's the, the, don't miss this about his death. It didn't happen in his home, okay? 5,000 plus people in the congregation. What's that word again, Derek? I don't forgot that quick. Colonnade. Peter and them up in a colonnade. Everybody can see. And you got to lock into this. Bags of money, man. They're dragging bags of gold up those steps, right? Bags of gold. Yo, Pete, look what we did, man. Ha, ah, we going to make that book for sure. And Peter stands there, dude, that ain't enough. Why you think you can deceit the Holy Spirit and you kept back something for yourself? You shouldn't have done that. You hadn't lied to me. You lied to God in front of 5,000 plus people. They all watching. Ooh, bam. Dead. Now, nobody, well, yeah, they did. Slain with the Spirit. Imagine what the church did. Whoa! 
What I like about the text, three hours later, Sapphira walks in. I know we made the list. Hey, Sapphira, see all that bag that came from your husband? Yeah, where's he at? You don't want to know. <laughs> Is that correct? And she's like, well, we agreed together. I'm his ride or die chick. So whatever he said. And here's, the, here's your out. She had a chance to say, no, it's not correct and preserve her life. But she wanted to see if the test was going to work. And guess what happened? She too fell dead. Here's what the text says. Great fear filled the whole church because they saw this. And, and my belief on this, God will not allow the presence of evil to infiltrate his camp. He's looking for unity in his church. And anything that breeds you this unity, he is going to address it. Are you hearing me? And for the first time in the history of this New Testament church, these people had an idea on how they can begin the divide. And God decided to close the chasm by dealing with them. Okay? Now, let me, let me go here. Let me go here. Let me go here. I'm almost done. Just a couple more things I want to walk through. Okay? So the consequences of the lies that they both died. And you remember Genesis chapter 2, a couple illustrations that I'm going to do. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17 kind of says, y'all remember this way? Remember this way? Is that, is that, is that um, when, Adam, when Satan went to Adam and Eve and he got Eve to partake of the fruit and he said this, did God say? Right? Remember that? And he says, you will not surely die. You will become like God knowing good from evil. The lie of the enemy is to fool us into thinking that we know better than God. That's why we make the wrong decisions that's against the way of God. James 4 says that if you know good to, to do good and you don't, it's considered what? Sin. Four principles and then I'm out of your way. Lock into this. Whenever we set out to deliberately do what we know we should not be doing, we are guilty of the sin of Ananias and Sapphira, and we have set ourselves up to be dealt with by God, number one, right? Second one is this. Whenever we say, God, I'm going to change my life, and we continue to do what we used to do after we come to God, we are guilty of the sin of Ananias and Sapphira, and we're setting ourselves up to be dealt with by God. Talking to this one, whenever we commit our finances to God, and we deliberately choose to do something else that benefits us. We are guilty of the sin of Ananias and Sapphira. And we've set ourselves up to be dealt with by God. Right? Log into this one. Whenever we say yes to God, but our lives continually reflect our past behaviors, we are guilty of the sin of Ananias and Sapphira. And we've set ourselves up to be get dealt with by God. It's my fact. When it comes to God and his kingdom... Hear me out, church. Don't say what you will do and then don't do it, right? Here's a big idea to take away with you. God will not tolerate evil and deception among his people because he knows our hearts. And he will expose and judge the sin of deceit caused by a selfish concern for a superior um, reputation. If you haven't heard me say anything else, here's a preaching idea. Don't lie to God. Don't lie to God. Bow your heads with me. As the worship team comes, let me put this on myself. If you're like me, after hearing that message, it's like, God, forgive me. And God, thank you for gracing me. Right? Because, man, I have been Ananias and Sapphira from time to time. I don't understand why I'm still alive. It's the grace of God. Come on, y'all. It's the grace of God. Come on, people. It's the grace of God. Here's what I'd like to do. I'd like for us just to take a moment to bow our heads and to just pray. 
And this is an individual prayer. This is not a corporate thing. It's, Lord, work on me. God, forgive me, right? God, thank you for gracing me because I have been guilty of the sin of Ananias and Sapphira because I too have lied to God. And it's nothing but your grace that has kept me here. So God, forgive me. So come on, church, every person for yourself, just like I had to go to God for myself. God, forgive me. Never again. I'm not going to say to you what I'm going to do and then not do it. So allow God to speak. Allow him to move. Allow him to have his way in our lives this morning. Holy Spirit, thank you for your word. Forgive us, God. For all the instances where we have all read this unity beat in our home, in the workplace, in the church, as people of God, to one-up ourselves. Forgive us, God. Forgive us. Forgive us. Forgive us. And God, if there's one here that don't know you as Lord and Savior, God, bring them to a place of repentance. A place, Lord, where we can know you different and we know you better. Thank you for this word. It's transformative calls us to be different, calls for a different level of commitment. So God, speak to us, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing. Holy Spirit, do what the Holy Spirit does. Reprove, correct, instruct, draw. And should there be one here, God, that don't know you as Lord and Savior, bring them to a place to say, I want to know God like that. So Lord, we love you. We praise you. Thank you for what you're doing, Lord. In your name, come on.